The dirty little secret about learning is that we forget. Uh, I have an annoying habit when I meet former students of mine of asking them, so what do you remember? Uh, in fact, once uh, a student who had been out for 10 years after having taken a course with me, and he went on to, into a different field, uh, we met at a reunion and he said, Professor, remember me? I took your course on memory. <laughs> and uh, I said, yes, I remember you very well. And he was uh, actually a fabulous student and apparently doing very well. So I said, so what do you remember? And this extremely bright, successful young man waxed incoherent. He says, well, well, you know, like stuff about memory and stuff. <laughs> Well, the learning curve, if the x-axis is time and the y is how much you learn, the learning curve goes like this. The forgetting curve goes like that. It's devastating. Now, does that mean the stuff has been erased from the brain? No. We know that it's still there. Because if you try to relearn what you had originally learned, the relearning is much faster than the original learning. So relearning is a kind of cued remembering. Now we as teachers often forget that our students forget. The purpose of education should not be to get students to learn stuff. It should be to get them to learn stuff in a way in which throughout their lives they're able to manifest that learning. And yet what we do is we have them in a course or a sequence of courses, and at the end of the course, we stamp a grade. That's how much they've learned. And we send them out into the world, and we forget about the next part, which goes like this. Now why, uh, what can we do about that? Well, there are lots and lots of things in the research about memory and retrieval. But I'll have time for just three quick points. Uh, and I'll call them active learning, retrieval practice, and mix it up, the mix it up principle. So number one, active learning. That's fairly well known. That if you can get students to engage in active forms of learning rather than just passively receiving information, the learning is much more powerful and much more enduring, even though the educational process is a little bit more messy. And so things like writing, uh, interaction, uh, framing the questions, discovering the answers for yourself, uh, those are forms of active learning. Sitting in a class where a teacher is lecturing and explaining things to you from beginning to end and writing things on the board, alas, does not produce very good retention years out. Second point, retrieval practice. There's a cognitive psychologist at UCLA named Robert Bjork who did a really interesting set of studies, and one of them goes like this. He brought volunteers in each day to learn a sequence, to learn sequences of keystrokes on a, on a keypad. And so there are several sequences they had to learn. And they came in each day to practice each sequence. And then they were tested each day for several days. And then they were tested at the end. And the volunteers were divided into two groups at random. One group practiced each sequence again and again before moving on to the next. And then they would practice only that one before moving on to the next. We'll call that the grouped condition. The second set of volunteers would practice one sequence and then another one. They were interleaved in random order. The same number of practices of each sequence, but mixed up rather than grouped. Now what you see is that for the the, the people in the grouped condition, learning is very fast, extremely fast. On the very first day, they really get it. And then each subsequent day, they're getting better and better. And when you test them at the end, they're really excellent. 
compared to those who are in the interleaved or random group who really don't do as well. But then if you wait some days and then you bring them back into the lab and test them, the results completely reverse. And those in the interleaved or random case do much better. Now why is that? That's completely counterintuitive and completely counter to a lot of how we organize education. The reason is that learning is very context specific. And your ability to retrieve something later on that you've learned depends very much on whether the context matches the context in which you've learned it. So while you're learning, if you mix up the context, that increases the likelihood that when you want to retrieve, the context will match one that you have learned in. Uh, the third point, um, which is, I'm sorry, that, that, was, that was the third point. Uh, my, my final claim about this third point is, is that uh, it's a personal story about learning the violin. When I learned the violin, uh, I was taught, and classical music pedagogy is very strict about this, that never practice faster than you can play. And so, uh, why don't I illustrate something? Do we happen to have a violin here in the house? OK, yeah, thank you. These organizers are so good. OK, so uh, take a very simple kind of thing. When I was more of a beginner, I would play something like this. Very slow. Actually, when I was even more of a beginner, I would play. OK, but slowly. And, uh, but what I really wanted to be playing was the piece itself, which went something like this. Now that involves a complicated technique in the right hand called spiccato, where you bounce the bow, the bow very fast. But it cannot be played slow. So how do you practice that slow before you get to be fast? And so I got to the point where I could play the left hand fast enough And I could play the right hand correctly. But when I tried them together, it was mush. Something like that. So the teacher said, ah, oh, you're playing too fast. Start slow and then speed up. And so you go up go. Unfortunately, the context of that is completely different from the context of, of playing fast. The fingers in the left hand, when you're playing slowly, are fairly independent. Whereas when you're playing fast, while one finger is being depressed, another one is rising, and a third one is anticipating the next note. So the entire context is qualitatively different. It's not just faster. And with the right hand, the same thing. If I'm playing slow, it's more of an arm movement. Whereas I'm playing fast, the bow, you find a spot on the bow where, the, where you, gravity and your sort of movement kind of just take care of itself. Like that. So I decided, uh, because I used to teach cognitive psychology and learning and memory, why don't I actually try to practice faster than I can play? And initially, it was mush. It was something like that. They just didn't coordinate. But after a while, it actually gets better, and you get the whole thing down. It's still a little mushy, because I haven't a lot of, had a lot of time to practice. Now, this goes completely contrary to the teachings you know, in, 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 uh, in pedagogy. And yet, a lot of what we do in education is counterintuitive. And so I leave, uh, what does this have to do with memory, though? It has a lot to do with memory, because when you play fast, there is motor memory involved. Your, 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 uh, your, your motor system has to remember which fingers need to come up when because it's really too fast for you to actually be thinking it through. So I'll just leave you with the final message again, that the dirty little secret uh, about learning is that we forget. So please remember, don't forget that. Yeah. Okay.